Okay, we're we're starting. <clears throat> All right. It is. Um, let's see. Okay, well, um, we were talking about uh, the republic versus the democracy. Um, on, the, on the CD that we passed out, <coughs> we go into that subject of republic versus democracy. And one of the things that we have on here is uh, an army publication where um, the, the military used to have educational material teaching people, certainly teaching their officers what the difference was between a democracy and a, uh, a, a republic. So um, for some reason, oh, here it is. So you click on it. So this, yeah, this, they, they go into what citizenship is and they point out that the citizenship always leads to a dictatorship or anarchy, but it, it, it does not lead to freedom. When you, when you in, a, in a republic where you're sovereign, where you can suspend the rules on your own authority, uh, so long as you do not impose on the sovereignty of someone else, well, that leads to freedom because when the rules become obnoxious, you can just say, forget it, I'm not going to obey it. That's the beauty of a republic. And the, the founding fathers had a confidence in the public at large. They, they, they believed more in the people than they did in, in the specialists running government because they knew how human nature is and how government nature is. So anyway, this is, um, this is the, the publication by the military, very short. Training manual number 2000-25, and you just click on here, and we got a copy of it. It's on a, uh, it's in a word processor file. So I'll bring it up here, <clears throat> just so you can say you saw it. Oh, a little slow. There it is. War Department, 1928. That was back when they uh, a cat. believed in it. Yes. Yes, that's one of the. No, you let the cat out of the back. Yes, I did. <laughs> that's what they called me in some. Yeah, she's chasing a butterfly now. But uh, here, I can hide him. Now he's gone. Okay, but anyhow, so they, they go into what citizenship is and they go into all sorts of stuff but as it relates to the military. But it's interesting, they, don't all, they no longer publish that manual, I understand, because basically they're trying to convert this over to a democracy. <clears throat> is there a copy of that on the CD? Yes, that's where you're looking at right now. Yep. And um, let's see, let's go back. <clears throat> if you want, um, we go to the, the uh, essay category on this CD under essays. I think this is where it is. We have, um, here we are, in 1792, uh, Philip Freneau wrote an article in his newspaper on how to, uh, he wrote the rules for changing a republic into a monarchy. And of course the intermediate step <clears throat> would be a democracy. So he, has, he lays out the whole plan and if you take the time to read it, you'll see that's exactly what they've done. The one thing that's happening today that was never anticipated by the founding fathers was the arrival of the internet. 
electronic communications. Never in the history of the world that we know of <clears throat> have we ever had the high-speed communications. And I'm sure a few of you, certainly I do, have a mailing list of people you send out interesting things to, jokes or whatever, and for communicating. Well, that's the power of the press, personalized. You can duplicate your thoughts and, and send them out en masse mm -hmm. for a fraction of a cent. That's pretty good. So <clears throat> it's an interesting, you know, knowing my history as I do, which isn't all that great, but the little bit of history I do know, I think there's an interesting race going on between the government doing its natural thing, which is taking over its own people, versus the people becoming awake and doing something about it before it happens. And I'm not sure which side's going to win, but I'll say one thing, the internet certainly upset the formula. <laughs> you know, and <clears throat> anyhow, so there's that. Back to the foundation here. Okay, when California was admitted to the Union, it had to be a republic. So here's, the, here's a copy of the admission. And they say, whereas the people of California presented a constitution and asked admission into the Union, which constitution was submitted to Congress by the President of the United States by message date February 13, 1850, and which on due examination is found to be Republican in its form of government? being enacted by, and so forth, and they went and admitted this, the state into the Union. So all the states have to go through this process because the, the <coughs> Constitution for the United States demands it, mandates it. They have to be a Republican form of government before they can join. So there you, there you have it. <clears throat> now, Let's talk about a court. What is a court? <clears throat> There's a couple of definitions. One of the definitions is legal, and the other one's practical. Okay? So, <clears throat> on the practical side, all a court is <clears throat> is basically the, the, the sovereign sitting on his throne with, surrounded by his courtiers you know, the people who gravitate to the center of power. So, <clears throat> so the thing is, is that in the traditional perspective of what a king is or a dictator is, you have this story, this scenario. The king is sitting on his throne and he's looking out the window and he sees some knave out there stealing oranges off of his favorite orange tree. So he does the kingly thing. He sends the guard out, picks the guy up, throws him in the dungeon. Okay? That's all. Very simple. After all, he's the king. <clears throat> well, what happens after that is on dungeon visiting day, the, uh, the knave's brother visits him. And he complains to his brother about how unfairly he was treated. He really didn't, uh, nobody heard his side of the story. And, and so it, it's unfair that he get three years of prison time, dungeon time, and so forth. And of course the brother, being a brother, is very sympathetic. And he says to him, he says, well, he says, uh, yeah, that's a bad deal, he says, I'll take care of this for you. And that night, because the brother turned out to be the chief cook, the king dies of an overdose of arsenic. <laughs> yeah, that's all. That's how, that's, things, that's how things got settled, you know, sometimes. Well, that's a bad deal for, for uh, kings. So we got this court system. Now just, let's recast the scenario. <clears throat> King's sitting on his throne, he looks out the window, and he sees some knave stealing oranges off his favorite orange tree. So far the story is the same. So he sends the guard out. The guard goes out, picks up the guy, brings him before. They accuse him of doing this, 
They ask him how he pleads. They get the various witnesses. They set up the procedure. They make an announcement, a public announcement. We're going to have this trial on a certain date. Everybody shows up at the trial, including the, the uh, Knave's brother, the chief cook. And they have the trial. They present the evidence. And then they have a decision, if necessary. Maybe have a jury out there you know, to, to look at it and so forth. Then they convict him. And then he gets his three years in the dungeon. <laughs> OK? Now, the, uh, uh, on dungeon visiting day, the brother visits the uh, prisoner. And the prisoner complains about it, what an unfair deal it was, how he didn't really do it, and, and so on. And, and the brother says, look, bro, he says, I attended your trial. I saw the evidence. I said, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, but you're, you know, <laughs> you kind of earned it. And so as a consequence of that, the king gets to live another day, arsenic-free day. <laughs> OK? So what I'm pointing out here is that the number one purpose of a court, above all the other things that you've heard, all the things you've read about, all the court rules and procedures and everything else, the number one thing about a court is that it is a stage upon which the sovereign puts a show to convince the rest of the world that the sovereign is right. That's the purpose of a court. Okay. Nothing can violate that rule. I don't care what, the, what, what goes on in the courtroom and so forth. That is the number one rule you never violate. You must put on a good show. I've had people ask me questions about doing certain procedures and so forth, and then I ask them, well, is that a good show? Does that convince the rest of the world that you're right? Well, it turns out it doesn't a lot of times. You know, Just because you're legally right doesn't mean you're right in the public per perception. And who is this public I'm talking about? Well, it's the court clerk, it's the sheriff, it's the marshal, it's the cops, it's the mayor of the city if the case is important enough for him to notice it, and so on. It's all these, all these people who hold the guns. Okay, you want those people to be convinced you're right. Now, they may know they're doing wrong and taking your rights away on purpose. But the first step is to have them know you're right. Now, when they know you're right and they're wrong, that takes a little bit of steam out of their, their efforts. OK? There's something about us humans that, in general, we tend to limit ourselves. Just like I told you the story earlier about the Buddhist uh, monk that was head of all the other monks. Nobody would kill him because they liked him. Okay, he knew how to run his court, so to speak. He knew how to keep things looking good, so that as he did his damage, he still people held back. They didn't they didn't take retribution on him, even though he was a major problem internationally for the government. So that's the first consideration. A court is a stage upon which the sovereign conducts his show, so as to satisfy the rest of the world that his decision is a good one. Now, sometimes you do find somebody not guilty, but basically, you're the, you're the plaintiff, the sovereign plaintiff. You know what the person did to you. He knows what you did to you. I mean, between you, you know what the truth is. So why have the court? You know, well, it's because you're actually putting on a show for the rest of the world. So put on a good show, OK? Don't take shortcuts. It'll pay. So that's what a court really is in practical terms. Now, there's all kinds of courts. OK, you know about admiralty courts, maritime courts, uh, court of the exchequer, court of claims, all kinds of courts. But in America, there is only one court. And that's a court of record. All the other courts are what we call Nisi Prius courts. They are courts that exist because you failed to object. OK? And you call it what kind of court? A Nisi Prius court. That's spelled N-I-S-I. -S -S -I, and the next word is Prius. P-R-I-U-S. 
U.S. Nisi Prius. That translates from Latin into without prior objection. A Nisi Prius court is a court that exists because of no prior objection. Okay? So, and you'll see it's right here. You see it, I have it on the menu, Nisi Prius court. And one time, I got a letter from somebody objecting. And so I put his objection up on the website, and then I put my answer to it, describing an Nisi Prius court. It might be worth studying. But the important thing to understand about an Nisi Prius court is it's a court that exists without objection. So all those courts I mentioned are Nisi Prius courts. Another way, you could call them contract courts. But they're contracted because of your failure to object. So you don't have to have an overt act to have a contract. I mean, an overt agreement. By the actions of the parties, you know there's a contract going on. You know, if I give you some money and then I walk off and take your car, we never had an agreement to do that, but you accepted the money and I accepted the car. You gave me the keys. Even if we never spoke a word, you know that there's some meeting of the minds there. Some agreement, right? After all, you took the money and I took the car. So a contract can exist on nothing more than the action of the parties. You don't have to have it in writing. You don't have to have the word spoken or anything else. Just what you did. It shows there's a contract, an agreement, understanding. Nobody objected, right? You didn't object to me taking your car, and I didn't object to you accepting my money. <laughs> so there's an, there's an implied contract there. Well, the reason, Mr. Bill, we go back and forth like ping pong on my case is that I knew right away they would need new contracts. But since I refused to get into their play, then that's what started the bouncing ball back and forth, you know, until the end of the day, you know, until the end of the year. So that really explained a whole lot. Mm -hmm. If you're in contract, then you could play in contract. If not, you understand what the court you're in. Sure. But I don't want to play the game. That's what it is. Right. You don't have to agree to a contract and don't act like you do. Or if you do act like you, you're going to uh, go into a contract, uh, make an objection when you go in. Now, what used to be known as a Uniform Commercial Code Section 1-207, or I guess in California it's 1207. Well, the reason being too, Mr. Bill, that I object on the contract is I don't want to make a conflict in Constitution about saying that you cannot pay the debt and the Congress only allowed to make something money concerned if they made with gold and silver. Well, so I understood that too. So I don't want to make a conflict on that. Well, you can do, look, a contract, you can do anything you want. It doesn't matter if it's gold or silver involved. It's, it's whatever you, the parties agree to. Because in your sovereign capacity, you have unlimited power to contract. Well, that's true too, but the thing is, my understanding is go beyond that. I understand too that the national debt, that's why we have so much deficit out there. That's I don't want to add in something to that. But that doesn't affect my contract with you if I had one. Yeah, that's true too. So it depends yeah. how you play your role. Yeah. That's why I know, I have to know my cards. Well, it goes back to the idea, if you don't want to argue a point, don't bring it up. <laughs> you know, you do not have to uh, involve the national debt. If you don't mention it, you can still have your contract independent of that. You well, can yeah, I know too. Just like what I said, I know all my cards, so I play my role. Okay. So if they bring the contract, which they have advertising there, that's contract, invite me, that's where I go in. So okay. ethically, I did fairness to my own self, but they did not. So they did. We had a good case. They did trespass on this queen. That's all it is. Okay. <laughs> well, the um, uh, what's that? Go on the microphone.
Phil, I had this. Uh, I had this issue with the city of Carlsbad. They wanted me to fill out a driver, uh, business license form. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't need to. I said, I, I, don't, I don't need your permission to contract. Mm -hmm. You know, and That's I said. common law, right? Yeah, and I said, show me where you can force me to do this. And the lady said, well, I'll get back to you. I gave her my number, never heard from her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, a lot of times they're, they're uh, one of the one of the characteristics of uh, a true monarchy or a true dictatorship is that things are done at the whim of the uh, dictator. It's policy instead of law. So they they have their policies of what they do, but obviously so far anyway, there's no law. Uh, greetings, Bill. I, I got a question for you. Get close to the mic. Okay, I, I've got a question for you. I, I've got a, a building permit. Mm -hmm. That's still active, and uh, I was wondering uh, if, if I have that building permit and it's still active, if a judge can uh, appoint a receiver, don't you have the jurisdiction to appoint a receiver when I've got a contract, a contract with the city? Well, that answer is very simply answered by reading the contract. Okay. You know, if it's not in the contract, you can't do it. Yes, that's what I thought. Yeah. I didn't think you had jurisdiction. You know, where where. And if, and if the uh, contracting party does not make a claim of an injury or threat of injury because of your failure to do or your threat to do something, then the judge has no authority either. But that's all in their court anyway. What you really need to do is a counterclaim on these guys and sue them. Great. Okay, thank you very much. And we'll get into that later about the counterclaims. So, anyway, the... Uh, uh, so the Nisi Prius court is a court that exists because of the failure to object to whatever it is they are doing. And that's fine. If, you know, you can run a court any way you want as long as everybody agrees and as long as nobody objects. But if somebody objects, the only court that, that can exist without the voluntary participation of everybody is a court of record. Now, a court of record has to meet some criteria. Okay. Here's the requirements of a court of record. The first requirement is optional. It generally has a seal. The reason it's optional is because very simple. Back in olden days, the making of a seal was a very, very expensive proposition. They didn't have the tools, metalworking tools that we got today. And uh, there were sovereigns who were too poor to have their own private metallurgist. So the, gen the, the seal is optional. And in fact, if you want a seal, all you have to do is put the word seal by your signature, and now it's sealed. Are you and aware that Black's fifth and sixth took out that fourth, number four? Pardon? Black's fifth and sixth. Well, I'm working toward these things. So the, uh, uh, I, I went to uh, the United States District Court in Las Vegas uh, a couple years ago, and I wanted uh, some sort of a certified document which means they'd have to seal it, okay, or stamp the seal on it. And so the clerk stamped the seal on it. It was a rubber stamp, and it had four letters, S-E-A-L. Seal. <laughs> that was their seal. That's the United States District Court, okay? So that's all it takes for a seal. And so a seal's not exactly a big deal as far as its form, what its form is. However, a seal is an important item. Um, a, contract, a contract between two parties uh, is always a quid pro quo situation. In other words, you get something for something. You give up something, but you get something in return. That's what all contracts are. Those are called bilateral contracts because they work both directions. A, mono, uh, a uh, unilateral contract is not enforceable, okay? 
If somebody says to you, I'm going to give you $1,000 on Sunday, you don't have to do anything about it. I'm just going to, I'm just going to give it to you. And you make plans on that $1,000, and when Sunday comes, he says, I changed my mind. You have no case. Okay? Because you, you, there was nothing required of you. You didn't have to give up anything to get it. So a unilateral contract is simply not enforceable in any court. Okay? Now, having said that, there's one exception to that rule. And that's if the, con if, if the promise is sealed. If the person says, I'll give you $1,000 next Sunday, puts it in writing and seals it, the seal is the consideration. And when that seal goes on it, it's real. And that is enforceable. So now they're trying to minimize the importance of the seal. And you'll see that uh, a writing that is signed is considered uh, as good as a writing that's sealed, words to that effect. I don't remember the exact words that are in the statutes. But uh, the thing that I notice is that all of government, all the courts, they all have seals. So I don't believe what I read. <laughs> and it's a common law. You can't, they're not going to be able to change the common law. The seal is there to stay. Okay. Now, going beyond that, if you look in Black's Law Dictionary, uh, you look up what a court of record is, you'll see in Black's Law Dictionary, the fifth edition, that a court of record has the power to fine or imprison for contempt, and that it keeps a record of the proceedings. Okay? So that's what Black's fifth edition says. It leaves out the other two requirements. If you look in Black's Law Dictionary, 4th edition and earlier, you'll find all four requirements there. Interesting. Yeah. It, the fourth requirement is, is that it's proceeding according to the common law. That means no statutes, no codes. Okay? A court of record, the highest court of the land is a court of record. Okay? No statutes, no codes. So, <clears throat> you're proceeding according to the common law. Anybody ever hear of uh, statute of limitations? Mm -hmm. Doesn't apply in a court of record. Mm -hmm. Why? Statutes don't apply. There's no statutes in the common law. If a court of record is proceeding according to the common law, then statutes don't mean anything. They make their bed, they better sleep on it. Yep. Yes, sir. Is there such a thing as an Article Three court? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, but that, that's under the Constitution. We're outside the Constitution in the common law. We're, we're in an Article Zero court. <laughs> okay? <laughs> My own sovereign court. So, I guess the first thing is you have to establish that you are proceeding under common law as opposed to statutory law. Correct. Correct. And I'll show you how to do that. It's real easy. It's, in fact, it's fun. When you, see, when you see how we do this, you're going to love it. But we'll get to that. <clears throat> but the thing is, yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then let me add something to that. In the Bible, 1 Timothy 8 to 11 to 20, then it will explain an absolute that we are not connected to any law, period, well, absolute. You're, you're talking about First Timothy? Yeah, First Timothy. Yeah. Okay, let me explain that. Um, in what I do, I only have two biblical references, and, I, and they never show up in my court papers. But nevertheless, um, the United States is primarily a Christian nation. The laws are built on Christian, Judeo-Christian concepts. And uh, there are a couple of items in the Bible that are kind of interesting, that are supportive of this, this approach. One of them is, is that, uh, that we're all equal to God. Okay? Now, I know that's a radical statement for some people. But 
If you go specifically to the story of Adam and Eve, that's in Genesis uh, chapter 3, I think it is. And if you'll see where the serpent told Eve that uh, the reason she couldn't eat the, the fruit from the garden, from the tree, that tree in the garden, was because God knew that if she did eat of that fruit, she would become as God in that she would know good and evil, know the difference. That, that's the actual, you read the King James Version, you'll see that's exactly what it says. So later on, it turns out that the serpent did not lie. Because if you go to verse, I think it's 22 of chapter 3, you will see where God himself speaks. And he says, behold, the man has become as one of us in that he knows good and evil. So when it comes to knowing the difference between good and evil, we've achieved equality with God. Okay? And God says so himself right there. Because I've quoted it almost word for word. I'm very close if I didn't get it word for word. So this is a wonderful concept because just think, assuming that you could get a fair hearing during the Inquisition, okay, <laughs> which I regard as a man's activity rather than a godly activity. <clears throat> but let's assume you got a fair hearing. Somebody comes up to you and says, you know, just to pick a random example, you're wearing pink shoes. And that's wrong. Okay? Well, the natural response would be, well, who are you to tell me what's right and wrong? You know, we're equal humans. What is your authority? And then, yeah, what is your, no, who are you? Yeah, you could say what is your authority. But anyway, ultimately, you challenge them. Because by what? Can we say that one human being has anything over another human being? Well, the response, the inquisitional response would be, well, God sent me to tell you. Now, how can you argue against God? Okay, I mean, that's the ultimate argument, at least back then. Well, if you look at verse 22, it turns out that we're equal to God. That means if we're truly equal, now, we're not equal in terms of creating life or creating universes and, you know, a lot of areas, but we are equal when it comes to knowing good and evil. That's the point. And so you just simply say back to the person, well, thank you very much for bringing the message from God. I will take it under advisement. <laughs> okay? And you consider it. And, and if I get a message from God, I'm going to respectfully consider it but I still have free will, independence, and equality to make a decision as to whether it's truly good or evil, whatever the issue is. And I, I don't know, might decide the pink shoes are okay if I were the accused, you see? So that, that's the beauty of that. Now, this is backed up by 1 Timothy, where the, the full name is Paul's first epistle to Timothy. And Paul wrote a letter to, to Timothy explaining a few things. And one of the things that he explained was that he says right in there, the law is not for the, no, he says, the law is for the lawless, okay? It's not for the virtuous, the, there, there's three criteria that he names in there. You have to be uh, faith unfeigned. You have to be, basically you have to have a, a, a good intent. And the law is not written for the person with good intent. The law is written for the person who is the lawbreaker. Now what we're talking about here is, you see, when, 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 Eve ate the fruit of the garden along with Adam. That was, according to that story, that is when we achieved the knowledge of good and evil. And that's sometimes called the law of the heart. In other words, you know, you're born with this knowledge. Nobody has to teach it to you. You know certain things. And so, if you violate that law, 
then we have the written law to tell you what to do. Well, as it turned out, there were a lot of people, apparently, who ignored the law of the heart. And so, at some point in time, out came this thing called the Ten Commandments. And we told people what to do. You can't do this, you can't do that. Well, that law was not for the lawful person. That law, the Ten Commandments, was for the person who ignored his deal. And this reflects in our, our system of jurisprudence because you know, for example, to pick a very obvious example, you know that one of the Ten Commandments is thou shalt not kill. Now you're driving down the street, you're doing 25 miles an hour in a 35 mile an hour zone, and a little kid runs out from between some parked cars and you can't stop and you kill him. Did you violate the commandment that says thou shalt not kill? No, in our, in our system of thought, our philosophy, you are not held responsible. Why? Because you did not have the intent. Okay? If you have not the intent, then there is no conviction. You are not persecuted for accidents. Now that's different from what goes on in Islam. And I read about a case where this guy, an American, that might have had something to do with it, I don't know, but he parked in a parking lot, okay? And his car was the only car there. And he went into the building. While he was in the building, a hot rodder came around, happened to be a native, okay? And he went too fast to get around that curve. <laughs> and instead of navigating the curve, he went off into the parking lot, hit the American's car, and I don't know if it killed him or not, but certainly it created major damage, okay? So it got into court, Islamic court. And the American was held responsible, and the judge explained it to him, that what had happened was that the American had made a choice. He could have parked somewhere else, but because he made the choice that he did, he was being held responsible for his choice. little different way of looking at things okay so in our in our judeo-christian concepts we do not hold you responsible for genuine accidents we do hold you responsible when you you intentionally do something or even if not intentional if you are irresponsible you know if you're doing 100 miles an hour in a 25 mile an hour zone on a crowded street that's probably considered irresponsible you see, and that's why we have juries to 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 draw that dividing line of responsibility. Anyway, so those are. That was the Hammurabi code, which is eye for an eye, two for two. Oh, Hammurabi code, eye for eye, two for two. Okay, well, yeah. Islam. Sure. Well, anyway, th so that's my two cents worth on on uh, the religious or the biblical connection to our our system. <clears throat> And I have been told that, uh, that uh, behind the scenes that these are effective uh, rules. I don't know, I, don't, I never speak about them in my actual papers. Can you elaborate more on that international law? Oh, yeah. Well, international law doesn't really exist. Um, it's actually, they left a word out, it should be international common law. Because the international law operates just like the common law that we're familiar with. It's basically, you got to get together and have a contract to agree among yourselves and who's responsible for what. And they don't have a jury, but they, have, they assign a judge. But the judge, as things exist right now, has no more power than the participants agree to let him have power. The accused may decide not to go to the international court. So what do they do? Nothing, right? I, mean, that's, I think that's the status of things these days. So international court only works if the parties will contract to it. And that's, how, that's basically how uh, common law works, excepting that in the common law, if you have an injury, you can force the other person into the court. Why? Because we have a third party power to enforce it. Somebody with the guns that'll come in and back us up. That's called the marshal or the sheriff, okay? 
we don't have that on the international level yet. At least not, it's not operating perfectly. But the only thing that the is <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So now, anyway, um, it's proceeding according to the common law and not statutes. That's what a court of record is. The fifth one is the killer requirement. This is, this is the, the one that I just love. The tribunal is independent of the magistrate. Okay? Now, the tribunal is the one that does the judging. The magistrate is the one who's up there. Not, he's not creating court orders, but he's enforcing them. The magistrate is an administrator. He has no power of discretion. He cannot, he cannot quote, judge anything, okay? Unless you give him permission to. So the tribunal is independent of the magistrate. The one who does the judging is independent of the guy who's pro conducting the proceedings. Now, what is a magistrate? Since we know that the tribunal is independent, what is a magistrate? Well, we look down here. Magistrate, an official entrusted with the administration of the laws. Okay, not the management, not the creation, just administration. No thinking allowed on the part of the judge. That's what administrators do. They follow the rules. They don't make up the rules. Okay? And as the sovereign of the court, you're the rule maker, and if you wish to suspend a rule, you can. Okay? So, a magistrate is a person clothed with power as a public civil officer. That's a magistrate. And we're saying here that a court of record, in a court of record, the tribunal is independent of a magistrate. The tribunal is independent of a public civil officer. Okay? The judge is a public civil officer. He's a magistrate. How do I know that? Well, obviously I've concluded it from these descriptions, but you don't really have to be smart enough to conclude it. All you have to do is go down to California Penal Code, Section 808, persons designated as magistrates. The following persons are magistrates. The judge of the Supreme Court, the judges of the Courts of Appeal, the judges of the Superior Courts, the judges of the Municipal Courts, and the judges of the Justice Courts. They're all they're all the magistrates. Judges of the judges. All the all of them are magistrates. Uh -huh. Okay. Are you satisfied that judges are magistrates? Well, now the tribunal is the one who does the judging, and he's independent of the magistrates. Right here, number five. So when you separate. It's not it's not who comes first, it's what, what the job description is. Okay. okay. The, 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 tribunal comes the magistrate administers, the tribunal decides. Right. Okay. So when you are the sovereign of the court, I mean you have your kingdom. Now if you want to grant power to the judge to make a decision for you, you can. And that's what happens. You go to court, and right away, what do they do? They bring in statutes, codes, right? I mean, you have your attorney write up the papers, he says code such and such, says such and such, blah, 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 right? Well, right there, you're not in a court of record for that reason alone, because he brought in the statutes, all right? And then you go to court and the judge makes a decision. Boom, right there you know you're not in a court of record if the judge is making a decision. Of course, if you're in a court of record, and if you understand that, and if you're watching out for your rights, when he makes a decision, what do you do? Object, object. object. right. You say, I object. Why do you object? Now remember, you're the plaintiff when you do all this. This doesn't work if you're the defendant. Very important. Notice that. This only works if you're a plaintiff. All this stuff I'm telling you is only the prerogative of the plaintiff, the sovereign plaintiff. 
It is never the prerogative of the defendant. This does not work if you're a defendant. You do not own the court if you're a defendant. You're a subject of the court. So you must be the plaintiff if you're going to do any of this stuff. That's not such a tough thing to be. Because if you are the defendant, they started the trouble, I assume. Okay, they're coming after you. So you do a counterclaim, now you become the plaintiff, they become the defendant, and the issue that you raise is their jurisdiction. Do they have jurisdiction or not? And everything must stop until they prove their jurisdiction. No jurisdiction, what business do they have in proceeding? And how do we know what they have jurisdiction until they prove it? Okay, so they, the proceeding, now they, that doesn't mean they do stop. I mean, you have to sometimes really get tough with these people, but they'll try to proceed anyway because they're always testing your knowledge, right? They, they don't give up easily. No, they don't. No, they don't. If anybody knows it, she does. <laughs> so, yeah, they, they, they don't give up easily, but you have to know to object. You gotta make the record. By the way, does anybody here know what the record is? What is a record? That's all right. That's all right. You don't have to answer it. I'll tell you. Okay? There's a lot of confusion about a record. The docket sheet that you see when you go down to the court is not the record. The docket sheet contains in it the record, but the whole docket sheet is not the record. What the record is, is a chronology of only two things. What was proposed to the court and what the decision was that was made. That's it. That is the record. All the other detailed transcripts, whatever it is, that is not the record. What's the second one? The decision made. The first thing is what was proposed to the court, like a motion, for example. And the second thing is what was the decision made? That is the record and nothing else. They're in the back now. <clears throat> the other stuff is supplemental, supportive, but the record is what are you asking of the court and did the court grant it or not? That's it. Okay? So <clears throat> when the court keeps a record of the proceedings, that's all it's doing. Now, <clears throat> I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the word patient, you know, a doctor's patient. Now, does an auto mechanic have patients? No. He has customers, right? <clears throat> does a lawyer have patients? No. He has clients. Okay. Only a doctor has patients. The, the doctors own the word patient, okay? That is specifically associated with their profession. The word client is, in this, just like the word patient is owned by doctors, the word client is owned by attorneys. A client is somebody with whom you have an attorney-client relationship, okay? and you can make decisions for him, <clears throat> okay? You have control of his life. Power of attorney. Power of attorney, that's exactly right. And so a licensed attorney has a higher level of attorney relationship than a normal power of attorney would have, okay? Because he can actually follow through in court, in, in the existing courts. So. The attorneys own the word client. It is not proper to say, for example, an, ac an accountant does not have clients. They say it all the time, but that's an abuse of the word. The original proper legal meaning of the word client is as it's used in relation to an attorney. Now the word record is owned by a court of record. Equity courts do not keep records. Even though everything looks the same, they are not properly called records. Okay? That's why they call them docket sheets. 
Okay. They're called docket sheets. They're dockets because they're not records. Or what do they call it? There's another name I've been coming across now. Uh, not transcript, but uh, uh, I think it's something about actions. Uh, I forget anyway. But anyway, they have actions, uh, listings of actions, okay? And, and because they're not records. Only a court of record keeps records. The word record is properly only, only used when talking about the decisions and, and proposals that are made in a court of record. That's it. That's what a real record is. And the courts do not keep records? That's correct. They may keep notes. They have, they have a list of actions that were taken, but those are not properly called records. Now, then, Mr. Bill, we could finish the case. I think I got the answer now. Okay. Uh, if that's what it is, then we talk about Security Exchange Commission now. You're talking about what? Security Exchange Commission. Well, we I have a judgment of 50000 a day. Well, Security and Exchange Commission is an executive branch item. We're talking about courts here. I know, but that's where we get the moolah. No, you get it from the banks that lend it to us. Well, yeah. <laughs> we're on a debt system. But look, that, that doesn't have anything to do with what we're doing here. I, I just want to, you know, share to the group that uh, I, I know the answer, that's all. Okay. But uh, in, 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 the we, Bob, in the Bobier, they call it uh, building glass agent, mm -hmm. and you sign with red ink on one, in every pages to the lower right corner three times, and you do a sign three times to at the back, lower right corner. Well, so we, front and back. Then, then after that, then take it to Security Exchange Commission. Well, in this, in this. But, the, but that covers 1933 and 1934 Act. Okay. Well, in this proceeding that we have going on today, we do accept occasional non sequiturs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whatever you say. Okay. Let's see. All right. Let's. Uh, um, by the way. Anybody's concerned, we're on schedule. Yeah, uh, we're, yeah. I've, I've got a timed out process and I allowed time so that we can deviate and so forth. So no problem, in case anybody's worried whether or not we're going to cover the material. <laughs> I was concerned and now I'm relieved. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ted. <laughs> All right. Could you tell us what you've done in your past life? No, I, I, I never went under hypnosis and, no, and traced I back. Mean, what kind of career were you in? Oh, I was a computer programmer. Uh, for okay. The, for the government or no? No, no, just, I mean, I, I was bumping up against computers which are absolutely unyielding and non sympathetic. <laughs> toward my <laughs> <the> sovereignty. <laughs> toward, yeah, toward my sovereignty or anything else. I, and there's been many occasions, believe me, that I thought that there was a problem with the computer and I eventually found out it was me that was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that I was wrong. The computer was right. Yeah. Only once in my life, in my entire career, was there a time when I thought the computer was wrong and it turned out it was wrong. There was some electronic failure and, and yeah, it, it did fail. But only once in like, what? I've been in, involved with computers since 1960, uh, 58, 59, somewhere in there. Okay, so I, I've seen it develop. But anyway, uh, all right. So the court of record is the one court. Now, if you look at the Constitution, let's, let's go back to the Constitution, specifically Article Three. Uh, Your media looks mean. Yeah, he is mean. Don't mess with him. He's a sovereign eagle. <laughs> the sovereign eagle. He's vitamins. Well, let me let me uh, let me bring your attention to something here. Um, I don't know if you noticed it, but I'm wearing a tie. Okay. That's brown. Oh, 
I know. But Wrong tie. And the thing that I want you to notice is that when you're up close anyway, the stripes go this way. The stripes do not go the other way. Okay, that's not an accident. I select this tie based on the stripes. You want to do a close up? Okay. Then you're telling me you're the passenger, not the driver. I should have, I should have perhaps worn a more obvious tie, but anyway, the stripes go like you're reaching for your sword. The sword was worn on the left side, and you reach across, you pull it out, you're ready to do battle. Okay? So the sovereigns, when you look at the no parking signs, you know you have the circle with a stripe? The stripe goes the same way. That's an order from the sovereign. Okay? That, that stripe is a sovereign. Now, if you go the other way, that would be from a subject. Okay? So, so that from, from right to the left? Yeah, from the up, upper right shoulder to the lower left hip. Yeah, and you'll right see right. when they when when at uh, public affairs and they these uh, uh, metal happy public officials and they have these wide strips going across. That's the way they go across this way because they're representing the sovereign authority. Those yeah, the sashes, but they go the other way, not the way you indicated. Right. And so that um, if you go to court and you put on a suit and tie please make sure the stripes go the right the right way if the stripes go the right way it's pretty meaningless but if the stripes go the wrong way number one and number two if the judge is educated he'll know you're ignorant mm -hmm. okay if you have the stripes go the right way he doesn't know he has no way of knowing if you're ignorant or not he has to use other criteria if he knows what he's doing and he's in tune with those concepts and you have a tie going the wrong way, he knows you don't know what you're talking about. You're not really sovereign. But, but, Maybe you're fooling him. But the what? Maybe you're fooling him. Thinking about it. Maybe, maybe you're the I'm just, the I'm, I'm just telling you that these are the outward signs of sovereignty, okay? Established through a thousand years of heraldry, okay? This is what they do. This is... This is quite European in its resource, in its source, but uh, this is one of the signs in heraldry: is that the stripes going that way represent the sovereignty. Okay. Now, when uh, uh, if you if you pay attention to these details and you're aware of it, you, you can see this in operation. Now, here's an interesting thing. <clears throat> When the United States was founded, um, well, let me just say this. In England, the stripes go the other way. Everybody who wears a tie in, in England, the stripes go the other way. Now, about 40 years ago, I noticed something. I noticed that here in the United States, they started introducing neutral ties. Okay, in over a 10 year period, I saw the number of striped ties that went this way kind of go down a bit and more neutral ties were available. For about a 10 year period after that, the, the second 10 years, I noticed they introduced ties with stripes going the other way in the American market. And then in the last, in the third 10 years, I noticed that you had to hunt all over the place to find a tie with a stripe that went this way. What are they doing? They're Europeanizing the United States. They're trying to convert our system over to their system. You see, when we broke away from England, we, we said everybody is a sovereign. So everybody wore a tie with the stripes going this way. There are people who understood these things. Okay, these were the outward signs. And I know it seems frivolous, okay? No, I mean, it, it does, in a way it is frivolous. I mean, it, what difference does a stripe make, you know, in terms of who and what you are? But remember, people look at you and judge you. And if you understand these subtleties, then you have a better chance of getting what you want out of the system. Because even though you cannot tell them how smart you are, you can avoid telling them how dumb you are, okay? <laughs> So don't wear a tie with a stripe going the other way. Not when you go to court. All right? You never know who's up on that bench. Probably a Freemason anyway. 
Yeah, somebody like me. I'm a 32nd degree Freemason. You are? Yes, I am. Okay, and I have a whole... I hit a spot. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. You just showed me that you don't know what they're all about. But that's okay. I have, I have a, a, a DVD out. I think you can get it from, um, from Dennis, where I put on a seminar for people of our ilk, you know, the patriot type mentality, where I went into the history of Masonry, who they are, what they are. There's about 300 different independent Masonic organizations in the United States alone. So which Masonry are you talking about? Okay. <laughs> ones that are running the country. Ah, well, uh, just to deviate just a second on that. What percentage of government is being run by Masons? Well, we've had 14 since FDR. 14. 14. Now, what percentage of the government is being run by Christians? Zero. <laughs> I have no idea. I'll bet it's a lot more than 14. So you're saying, Mr. Bill, we're... Are you when I'm, when I'm point, well, you know, the, just because you have a president doesn't mean he runs the country. You know, there, there's a staff that it comes with it. The point I'm getting at is that I don't know why it is, but we take a minority organization and give them 100% responsibility for all the crap that goes on in government. Aren't the Christians responsible for anything? <laughs> they all say they're Christians. Most of them, far greater number, and they're there. And then, we, then there's other people blaming the Jews. How many Jews are in government? Well, there's a lot. But are there as many Jews as there are Christians? I'll bet the Christians outnumber them. So, but somehow they get all the blame for the people who hate Jews. They're blaming them 100% for all our troubles. The people who hate Masons, they're blaming them 100%. Aren't the Christians responsible for anything? I have a suggestion. I think the, there is responsibility there. Okay, so when you start labeling, you start labeling people, that's when you start falling into the trap because now that blinds you to the real facts. See, now I don't know how much this colors you. See, I, I, I brag about being a 32nd degree Mason, all right? I get that out on the table real fast when it comes up, okay? Now, here's the question. Does that color the credibility of what I tell you from this point on? <laughs> it shouldn't because, and here's why it shouldn't, because everything I've given to you up to this point is verifiable independent of me. I give you supporting case law. I haven't spoken it, but you go to these, this here. Everything has case law or original black letter law or something you can verify. You don't have to depend on me at all. Okay, so all I'm doing here, my primary job here, is to give you some guidance pointing to some things that I have found, and then you decide for yourself whether it applies to you. If you take my word on it, you're going to be in trouble, okay? Don't believe anything I tell you. You verify it. If somebody gives you a case, how many times, I don't know how, well, I don't know how deep you do your research. But how many times has somebody given you a case that was absolutely said exactly what you needed and you went and you looked it up and you couldn't even find the words in the case? Yeah. <laughs> All right? Check everything. I don't care how reliable the person seems to you. Check everything. Do not accept anything from anybody without checking it. And that includes me. Yeah. Okay? So are we English, Mr. Bill, or are we British, or are we European? No, we're Americans. Okay, well, that's not Americans an issue here. speak English. So we're, we're here because we have a common interest. Okay. Do your homework. Do your homework, right. Okay. So I'm out of the picture, am I? I'm still in the picture. Okay. All right, so um, going back to the oh, foundation. Are there any other symbols besides the tie? That's the big one, that's the, the stripes, one. right. Yeah, there's all kinds of symbols and subtleties, you know, if you want to be an expert. But generally, you're okay with simple business suit. But the tie, is that is, that is a major item in, in, uh, and your suit, in formal your suit, dress. If your suit has stripes, it should also be the same. <laughs> I think you can have vertical stripes. And pinstripes are okay. It's not only the tie, but the way it goes around the neck, it can be a loose, too. 
Yeah, that's true. <laughs> All right. So we've talked about a court of record. And uh, the court of record basically, uh, we're talking about a court. What is a court? We went to the practical definition. We've talked about a court of record. I want to talk about the officers of the court. The officers of court, that, that's nothing special. All that is is people who have jobs, OK? They have different functions. So I can represent some of those functions. Like, for example, I think I got one here. Who do you think this represents? The court clerk. A surfer. <laughs> When the, when the clerk takes the day off, he goes surfing. <laughs> so you see, the court clerk, he has his own hat, right? And you recognize it right away. Somebody said it before I said it, OK? So that's one of the jobs. Let's see, what other jobs do we have here? Here we go. Here's a nice one. No, that's the, the attorney, right? <laughs> So he wears that hat, OK? Now. No powdered wig? <laughs> we got to get another prop for you, Bill. <laughs> Just, <sir. laughs> That's right, the court jester. See, you know, your, you know your court structure, all right? I mean, you have to take time out. You remember right at the beginning, I said sometimes you have to have a little sense of humor and levity, OK? You can't, and court can be fun sometimes. And of course, they acknowledge that in, in court, they acknowledge that uh, uh, they have to take a break once in a while because that's a long standing tradition to have a jester in the court. Have that's his job. No, I probably ought to <laughs> sometimes. Okay, well, let's see. What else have we got here? <laughs> of course you do. Hey, he's hey, hey. He's got, he's got it. it. Of course. You wearing that, you must be in England. Okay. <laughs> there you are. Okay. So the, the magistrate. Now, have any of you ever wondered why the wigs are always white? You ever wondered? They run out of black. No, they're always white. They're why, why, do, why is there a tradition of white wigs? Uh, let's see. You said no. They're rather than that. Nope. They're always <laughs> white. There was a period in time when the nobility <clears throat> had a lot of power struggles. Of course, there's always power struggles. I mean, that, that's guaranteed. But the power struggles got a little serious, <clears throat> and the customary way of settling power struggles was to incorporate arsenic. You know, you incorporate arsenic. Poison. Put a little arsenic in the food. Poison. What? Yes. That usually settled up an argument about power, OK? Whoever ate it first lost. <clears throat> So arsenic was very common, all right? And that, and that is how they settled. And it was brother against sister, father against son. I mean, it, 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 there was no loyalty. You read the history. I've got a little book. I should have brought it in, I guess. But I have a little book on the history of Europe. And it, it's just a little book with maybe 100 pages. But every single page has at least three or four descriptions of somebody killing somebody in order to get in charge, <laughs> OK? I mean, it, this is how they did it. No loyalty among each other. They had nothing to do. They didn't work. You know, they, they, so they, they would kill each other in order. Well, and arsenic was the favorite method. Well, somebody discovered that if you eat a little bit of arsenic each day, you could build up your immunity. And you could take quite a hit with no effect. But the side effect was that your hair turned white. So all the nobility 
had white hair. And so it was very easy to tell the nobility, a nobleman, from a commoner. Commoner had colored hair. Nobility had white hair. Of course, that was why. They ate arsenic, okay? Well, when, when arsenic lost its favoritism and no longer became popular, the tradition continued. And so when you have high court proceedings or very formal proceedings, they put on the white wigs, and that's why, because of the nobility. It's carried over. Then everybody should wear a costume of a rat. <laughs> well, uh, in fact, um, there's been from time to time some serious discussion as to whether or not they should discontinue the wigs in the high court in England. And, you know, they, they, they recognize it as kind of frivolous now. But still, that, that's where it comes from. Yeah, tradition. Thank you. Tradition's kind of nice. It's kind of fun. Especially if you understand it and you see how it fits together. It looks nice on you, Mr. Bill. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you look like from England. You're an English man now. <laughs> You're no longer from Panama. Oh, yeah. Well, they're, they're, you know, I mean, look at the glorification of police now. When one of them dies, it's like a religious event, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? And, and, and people seem to gravitate to that sort of thing. They like <coughs> glorifying. There used to be a statute that a building, a public building, could not be named after a public official until at least two years after he passed away. Now it's like before he dies even, you know? And, and uh, so I don't know if they changed that statute or if they're just ignoring it. But, what's that? Well, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's how, it's how uh, human nature is a lot of ways. We like uh, pomp and circumstance, I guess they call it. And we like uh, those wonderful procedures and so on. Anyway, back to this. Let's see. <clears throat> All right. Superior court versus inferior court. You're going to love this. A superior court is a court of record. An inferior court is a court that's not an, a court of record. Okay? Superior court is a court of record. Right. Or the other way around. A court of record is a superior court. That's spelled with a small s. <clears throat> now, just to keep you confused, at least here in California, <clears throat> They name the courts Superior Court, but that's just the name, okay? Don't confuse the name with the function. So the Superior Court, capitalized, usually is an inferior court. How do you know? It's not a court of record. It's not proceeding according to the common law. The judge is making a decision. The tribunal is not independent of the magistrate. Those are the two big ones right there. Okay? So anytime you walk into a courtroom, you see that judge making a decision. I don't care if they call it the Superior Court. It's an inferior court. Now, yes? That's what I would do. <laughs> sure. Well, that, yeah, if you carry it out to the full formal extent, you would counterclaim them, but in a superior court, a real superior court. Okay? Now. Would that be an Article Three court? No, Article Three court is a court that's under the Constitution uh, of the United States. That Article Three refers to the Article Three of the United States Constitution. No, this is a court of record. Take it, take it for what it is on its surface, on its face. Okay. Don't try to make more out of it than what it is. So, a court of record has its criteria. I gave you the criteria, and that's backed up by case law. I mean, there's been cases on that where that was challenged, and and the court said, no, this is what a court of record is. So, 
uh, the uh, but let's look at superior court versus inferior court. Okay. Let's see if I can enlarge this. Uh, it's not working like it should. Okay. So, I just said it. A court of record is a superior court. A court not of record is an inferior court. Now, in, in ex parte Kearney, 55 Cal 212, and in Smith versus Andrews in 6 Cal 652, the court said, Inferior courts are those whose jurisdiction is limited and special and whose proceedings are not according to the course of the common law. It's pretty clear to me. I don't know. What do you think? Okay. Their jurisdiction is limited. Let me show you an example of what we mean by limited. Can, can a criminal court judge a civil matter? No. Can a civil court judge a criminal matter? No. Okay. These are limited jurisdiction courts. So therefore, they're inferior courts. When you go to court and you try to make an argument and the judge shuts you down because he says that's not related, okay, what is he doing? He's saying, we're staying within the limitations of this court. See, like the guy, I, you, we've all heard about the case, I'm sure, where the burglar came in through the roof and he fell. Yeah. And he got trapped in the garage. And therefore, he sued and won for damages because he couldn't get out of the garage. Okay? Now, when you take the whole big picture when you take the whole big picture into account, that doesn't make sense. Now, I didn't, I didn't see this case, but I can imagine how it went. You know, the, 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 the burglar is suing the homeowner. The homeowner is saying, but you broke in. And the judge is saying, that has nothing to do with the case. <laughs> you cannot trap a person in a container. Well, I'm just saying... I'm just saying that the court had limited jurisdiction. The judge could not listen to anything else. He could only listen to the immediate things relating to this, was he trapped or not trapped, okay? Doesn't matter how he got there. Now, a court that has unlimited jurisdiction, which is a superior court, it can take these factors into account. Okay? It can take everything into account. It can take into whether the sun was up or down into account. Okay? Interesting. So that's the big, one of the big differences between a superior court and an inferior court. Now, criminal courts proceed according to statutory law. Jurisdiction and procedure is defined by statute. Likewise, civil courts and admiralty courts proceed according to statutory law. Any court proceeding according to statutory law is not a court of record. Court of record only proceeds according to common law. It is an inferior court. Now, all right, gang, listen to this next one. Okay, listen to this very carefully because this is really important, this next one. The only inherent difference ordinarily recognized between superior and inferior courts is that there is a presumption in favor of the validity of the judgments of the superior court and no presumption in favor of the validity of the inferior court. Okay? Superior court makes a decision, we presume Unless there's some extraordinary reason otherwise, we presume it's a correct decision. If it's an inferior court, we don't make that presumption. We don't presume it's bad either. It just doesn't carry any automatic validity with it. Why? 
because it didn't take all the factors into account. It only operated within its limited perception, its limited scope, okay? <clears throat> Going on, it says, a superior court may be shown not to have had power to render a particular judgment by reference to its record. So you look at the record and you can see whether or not it had jurisdiction, okay? If it had no jurisdiction, then this judgment is no good. But if it had jurisdiction, it has a good judgment, okay? Note that in California, superior court is the name of a particular court, okay? So when it's capitalized. When a court acts by virtue of a special statute conferring jurisdiction in a certain class of cases, what are we talking about? We're talking about criminal courts, civil courts, right? Those are classes of cases, okay? <clears throat> when a court acts by virtue of a special statute conferring jurisdiction in a certain class of cases, it is a court of inferior or limited jurisdiction for the time being, no matter what its ordinary status may be, okay? The decisions of a superior court can only be challenged in a court of appeal. Yeah, but did we not challenge it? I don't know what you're talking about. The court of appeal we're in. Oh. Okay, that's, but the decisions of an inferior court are subject to collateral attack. In other words, in a superior court, one may sue an inferior court directly rather than resort to appeal to an appellate court. So you go through a case, they wouldn't let you put all the evidence in because it wasn't relevant, according to the judge. So after it's all over and the smoke blows away, you now file a suit and you name the court as a defendant. But you're not suing for money, you're suing for decision, okay? The original defendants, they are the ones at risk. But, I mean, the original plaintiff who came against you, he's the one that's at risk for money. But you sue that court because your claim is, is the court was an inferior court, therefore couldn't make a good decision, didn't make a good decision. And we have to get all the facts in, all of the considerations, and that's why we're reopening the case in a real superior court. So we're not in a court of record. You're in a court of record the second time. The second time. Yeah. Second time you open it up in a court of record. You, you open up. Remember, a court of record is a superior court. Also, a superior court is a court of record. Works both directions. Okay? You're proceeding according to the common law. The tribunal is independent of the magistrate. So any case you have, you can reopen. No statute of limitations, because there's no statutes in common law. Is this different than a counterclaim? No, a counterclaim is when somebody makes a claim against you. Or a cross-complaint. Well, a cross-complaint, that doesn't count either. But a counterclaim is when somebody has a claim against you, and then you come back and make a claim against them. But in order to make your counterclaim really stick as a counterclaim, the first thing you have to do is challenge their jurisdiction. If they do not have jurisdiction, then all of the consequential injuries that you suffered now become collectible items. Okay? Suable items. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Our page is well done, ready to cook. Okay. I mean, it already cooked, ready to eat, sir. All right. Thank you. He's talking about the case that we worked on. It was... It's done. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So the... Now, the decisions of a superior court may only be challenged in a court of appeal. But that little statement only applies to state courts. It does not apply to your court of record. Okay? Let's see. Let's go... Can you repeat that sentence again? I didn't quite catch it. The last sentence. Well, now I'm in trouble. No, it applies to them, but it... Oh, 
It applies the, the, the ability to appeal a decision only applies to state courts. It does not apply to your private court. Okay? Your, your court of record, where you're the sovereign of the court, well, it's king's bench, basically. In other words, you're the king, you're there. So there is no appeal from the king. All right? So there is appeal from a state court because the king's not there. The judge is sitting there. If they're operating according to the common law, I'm not sure how they ever worked that out. But I, I, I've never seen a court of record, frankly. They're all equity courts. No wonder, Mr. Bill, they keep calling me he instead of she. No, well, that's an artifact of the English language. Oh, well, uh, that's okay. That's my dad's name anyway. I'm proud. He? <laughs> well, he chose my daughter's last oh, name. Yeah. Yeah. Well, see, the thing is, is that in, in, in the English language, if the gender is unknown, then we use the masculine gender. That's okay. I'm That's proud. a rule. So it's, it, they, when, when somebody uses a masculine gender, you do not know if the gender is, is male or female. See? A lot of people object to it because they don't understand the neutrality of that. So, anyhow... Now you're going to love this next item. Okay. This last paragraph, I really ought to put this up front. Maybe I'll get around and revise this thing, the website. But it's the last paragraph. Now listen to this. The Supreme Court in Schneckloth versus Bustamante, 412 U.S. 218, on page 255 in 1973. Uh, they, that case in 1973 cited a very old case called Ex Party Watkins, three Peters at uh, 202 and 203. And what they said was this, here it is. No statutory or constitutional court, whether it be an appellate or Supreme Court, can second guess the judgment of a court of record. Quote, the judgment of a court of record whose jurisdiction is final is as conclusive on all the world as the judgment of this court would be, this court being the Supreme Court. It is as conclusive on this court as it is on other courts. It puts an end to inquiry concerning the fact by deciding it. So when you have a court of record and you come to that final judgment, that's it, kiddo. Not appealable. Now, that doesn't mean you can't go at it again. Remember, I said earlier that you can have a new trial on a case. But what's the probability of winning? <laughs> you know? However, the jury decided last time, it's going to decide the same thing this time. So, you know, it could so be a different jury. Different jury. I mean, if you really had a jury that went awry, yeah, it might be worth a shot. But again, a uh, third trial only happens two, three times in a century. You know, it doesn't happen often at all. And so the system works, you know. But it, it's, it's a new jury considering new things. There have to be new things that, pretty much, unless, like I said, you've got a really sick jury, which is not likely. That's the beautiful part about a jury. I, I've, be, I've done jury duty. Are we ready to start here? <clears throat> Everybody ready to start? Oh, we're on the air? Okay, I'll start talking. So, anyway, the, the court of record, the decision of the court of record is not appealable. Any decision comes out of your court of record is not appealable. <clears throat> your court is king's bench. By the way, the word bench means court. Okay, so it's king's bench. You, uh, whatever the king decides, you can't go above the sovereign. Okay, so if some, whoever you're suing, if they don't ask for a jury of sovereigns, of peers, well then, ain't gonna make it. You know, <laughs> you had a question. Yeah, Bill. Um, uh, California Constitution says that a court of record 
um, or that says that uh, all three levels of courts, Superior Court, Appellate Court, and Supreme Court are courts of record. Right. So why did they do that if uh, a court of record is not appealable? Well, state courts, well, that, that is an anomaly. Uh, but remember this. The superior court can be an inferior court. We need a microphone here. The superior court may be an inferior court. And its decisions are appealable to the appellate court, which is a court of record, which can take everything into account. On the other hand, if the appellate court acts like an inferior court, its decision can be appealed to the court of record called the superior court. Does that deal with it? OK? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't answer it that way the first time you asked me. <laughs> it took me a while to figure out the answer. So um, let's see. Now, you all know, here's some, here's a, an, I'm going to bring out some important things in the review here. Number one, what, is, what are the two significant points about sovereignty that I've repeated before? What are the two significant things about sovereignty? That what what is characteristic of a sovereign? No accountability to a higher level. Right, that's one. The decree of the sovereign makes law. The decree of the sovereign makes law. Right. Very important. When you when you sue somebody, you make your decree of what the law is that you're saying got violated. When you sue somebody in your lawsuit, you decree the law, the laws that you're claiming that they broke. They have an obligation to you of some kind. It could be an obligation to pay you money or it could be an obligation to not punch you in the nose. But whatever the, the obligation is, an obligation to do or an obligation to not do, Whatever that obligation is, you decree what the law is. So, so that's one point that you have a, a court of record, or not a court of record, I meant to say sovereignty has these two features. It has, there's other features too, but those are the key ones. Okay, no accountability to higher authority, and uh, the decree of the sovereign makes law. So that's what Bill Clinton was doing when he said depends on what his is. Uh, no, I think he was in equity court there. You think what? He was in equity court when he said that. He was not in a court of record. But he's, a, he's an attorney. He knew what he was doing. He was being okay. tried by the Senate. So that's, that was the... Uh, yeah, was well, he, had, he, he understood the game. So, um, sovereignty is an important aspect of what we do here. You've got to have your sovereignty. Now, in order to make it work, you've got to be the plaintiff. So, I assume that you all know how to do a, a lawsuit. Now, this, this uh, session we're having today is not a session on procedure. This is a session on concepts. I'm giving you the concepts with which to do procedure. We'll, we talk a little bit about procedure, but the emphasis is on concepts. Now, there is a company called, uh, a website, a website called jurisdictionary.com. J-U-R-I-S, as in Sam, dictionary. All one word, jurisdictionary.com. And they sell a course, I think it's for $219, a two-day course, it, and it's written by an attorney. It all has to do with procedure. Um, he thinks I'm a jerk. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so uh, that's okay. Uh, he's, I expect that because he is an attorney. And yes? Let's make right here. 
Oh, you got it? Yeah. Okay. You, you bought the course? Yeah. What do you think of it? I like it. Great. Yeah, he, he goes into procedures. He talks about motions. He talks about evidence. talks about all kinds of stuff. Basically, he gives it around a picture. He, he says it's a two-day course. I suspect it takes longer to study it. But nevertheless, he's gone to the trouble to give you the, the, the generally acceptable court procedures that apply to all courts. So if you take that procedure-wise and add to it the concepts that we have here, you've got a real powerful combination. I haven't focused on jurisdiction. I haven't focused on procedure because he has. No point in reinventing the wheel. Yeah. And, and it's very reasonably priced. No, get on the top all the time. Why go to the bottom? I don't understand that. No, someday you will. So. <laughs> I don't understand that. I object. <laughs> okay. Richard. Okay, so. I'm sorry. Hmm? Oh, great. Okay. I don't think he'll like that, but okay. He's a jerk. No, he's a good guy. I've, I've had communications with him, and, but, you know, he doesn't have the time to really dig in and spend a day like you're spending a day to see what this is about. He just doesn't have that kind of time as an attorney. I'm, I'm sure of that. And, uh, and he already has gone through training. He already knows what he knows, and what he does works for him. So let it be, let it be you know. In the meantime, we understand the problems of, of being... Uh, uh, political defendants, you know, or de abuse of law and this sort of stuff. Anyway. And we have to understand, too, the, na the, uh, the name attorney is a torn. And if we go play by him, then we become incompetent. Then we're not sovereign. Mm -hmm. So what's the study is all about? Don't make a ring. So that makes no doubt in my head. If I play sovereign, why I need to rely with someone else? Make sense? Okay, now, <coughs> so I want you to lock down in your mind you those two things about sovereignty. This is extremely important that you always keep this in mind, that you're, you're not accountable to higher authority and your decree makes law. <clears throat> also, I want you to remember what a republic is. You're in your sovereign capacity. Now, if you're sovereign, you do what sovereigns do. You have your own court system. You have your own uh, laws. You can do all that stuff. The, the thing that keeps you from getting too extravagant is the fact that if you do decide to enforce your laws against someone, they can always call a jury who can sit in judgment of your laws. So that, that uh, probably keeps you from preventing, uh, keeps, you, uh, keeps you from enforcing uh, all of your laws, even reasonable ones like pink shoes and such, you know. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to go clean my ties out one. <laughs> clean your what out? Ties. Oh, clean out your ties, yeah. So, Bill, does that mean that we could go into their building and you can wear a hat anywhere? In theory, yeah. I mean, but, you know, you, you don't re remember that what is the number one definition of a court? It's a stage. It's a stage upon which you put a show. So if you're going to go in and buck the traditions and buck the, the, the customary way of doing things, all that does is generate trouble for you. Because, you know, uh, there was this gentleman in Germany, his name was um, Goethe, I think it was, was. He was a philosopher. And he said that there's nothing so fearful as ignorance in action. Okay? As ignorance in action. There is nothing so fearful as ignorance in action. And, uh, and so you go in there with your superior knowledge, supposedly superior, and these people don't know what you do, and they just might go into action. And you might find yourself behind bars, all because you knew something they didn't. 
and you knew that it didn't matter whether or not you wore a hat. But they told you to take the hat off, and you didn't, so you went to jail. <laughs> okay? I suggest that you don't challenge the people around you. Remember this. There's a very important rule. In the land of the insane, the sane man will be adjudged insane. Yeah. Okay? That's true. So understand who's around you and, and, and you know, you've got to put a, a proper show on and you've got to take into account that you're not actually free even though you think you are because you can get these kickbacks or blowbacks, I think is the new term. Well, I was holding really good and tight and lock everything in until Judge Sokolov say, well, we've been here since 3 15. Now it's almost, you know, 5 o'clock dinner time. And, you know, and I feel so. Then my nose started getting soft, you know. And I said, okay, why not go right here? So I practically lift the burden in his shoulder and put it on me. And that's the reason why they sent me to Twin Tower. But I was doing okay. great because that's my objection. Where you get the jurisdiction? You ain't got no jurisdiction over me. Uh, we just tag along back and forth like that for hours and some, you know, well, until I give up. Well, well, basically, you had to put up with either their lack of knowledge or their choice to ignore what they knew. Oh, yeah, they did. That happens. Well, anyhow, um, so keep in mind, as I said before, what sovereignty is. Keep in mind that the, that the number one rule about courts is that it's a, a show. You want to put on a good show. And even though you're right, if it's a bad show, then don't do it. Don't claim it unless it's really, really critical to what you're doing. Um, keep in mind what a court of record is. And that uh, it's proceeding according to the common law and don't allow the judge to make any decisions. Okay? Now you're, if you're the sovereign of the court, you're, you're the, the plaintiff, if the judge makes a decision, all you do is you object. Okay? Now, in fact, let me give you a procedure here oh. that. Well, I'm going to give you this procedure. You'll see how this works. Okay? What page what was that when we were before? I don't know. Oh, well. We were somewhere. I lost track. I don't think I can go back to it. In theater court. Anyway. Um, we have on this disc, what do you do when you are in front of a judge? Okay? This is very important. See, when, when you have your paper, when you're in your court process and you've done your counterclaim, when, if you're in front of a judge, the reason you're there is because somebody, either you or the other side, is asking the court to do something. That's called a motion. Okay? And so the judge is going to try and make a decision. If it's your court and you have a court of record, he cannot make a decision. He's prohibited. But that doesn't mean he, he won't do it. And so you, when you're in front of that judge, you want to be able to keep things under control. And, and under control in the sense that even if he doesn't do the right thing, you're not lost. Okay. So uh, you have to be the plaintiff, as I said before. Now, here's, here's what happens. I'll just read off this, this article. It's, it's short and, and sweet. When you are a plaintiff and one of the people of the United States or a state in a court of record, the judge has no power to make a decision unless you grant it to him. The tribunal, which is either you or a jury, is independent of the magistrate and all judges in California are magistrates. When in court, there is no need to argue your case. All of your arguments should have been made in the preceding paperwork. The only reason for a court hearing is to give the court an opportunity to ask questions of the litigants to clarify any points. Anything you say in court is considered a novation to your papers on file. Your verbal actions override your previous papers. That's why you don't talk in court. Now, get this. Somebody makes a motion. That's whatever it is that he wants. He says, I want this from the court. The other person answers the motion from his side. And he introduces his own 
pecados, whatever. And then you have a third chance to come back and say whatever it is, but your answer, your reply to his answer is narrowed down to the issues that were raised in his, his paper, okay? That's your typical three paper set. Everything you have to say should be in those papers. Basically, you spoke on paper and the other side spoke on paper. That's your speaking. The only reason for a court hearing is so that the court can ask you questions. That's it. A court doesn't have to have a hearing at all. And in fact, if you go down to Florida, down there in that, those courts, you put your motions in and you get your rulings back. You never have a hearing. Normally you don't have a hearing. Why? Because those guys down there, apparently they feel they understand your paperwork. There's no need to call you in. If they, need, if they do have questions, they'll set a hearing date, notify you, and you come in, and then you, you talk. But the only purpose of a hearing is to give the, ch the court a chance to speak or ask questions to clarify points. That's it. Your argument is through when you put that paper in. So knowing that, here's our procedure. Just as I said, when in court, there's no need to argue your case. All of your arguments should have been made in the preceding paperwork. The only reason for a court hearing is to give the court an opportunity to ask questions of the litigants to clarify any points. Now here's a, some suggestions on court procedure. <clears throat> First of all, don't verbally discuss anything in court. Nothing. <clears throat> the judges and attorneys in court are word masters. They are much more practiced at word interpretation and manipulation than you are. Anything you say will be held against you and will provide opportunities to nullify your paperwork. The best thing is not to discuss anything. When the judge asks you anything about your papers or points, you should so only say, I have nothing to say. It's all in my filed papers, Your Honor. Okay? That's it. Do not discuss it. That forces the judge to consider your papers rather than what you may say in the hearing. You open your mouth, you're dead. Okay, because now he interprets. You say it's raining outside, and he interprets that to mean there was no rain at all. You know, you have no control over his interpretations. Therefore, don't give him ammunition. All right? If he wants to know what you have to say, it's all in the paperwork, Your Honor. I have nothing to say. Second thing, <clears throat> object to anything of which you do not approve that occurs in the courtroom. Okay. I object to the hearing. Of course, if you made the motion, don't object to the hearing, okay? <laughs> but if the other side made the motion, object to the whole thing. Uh, whatever it is, whatever they say, if you don't like it, object to it. Certainly don't allow any decisions on the part of the judge without objecting, okay? He makes the decision, you object, all right? So, Here's, a, here's a, a, a script. Typical courtroom scenario. Something happens in the courtroom. Whatever it is. You say, I object. The judge says, why do you object? You say, it's not my wish. The judge says, if that's the best you can do, you're overruled. And you say, well, for the record, I do object. And then he says, your objection is noted. Okay? And he might even say, you're overruled. Well, what you did is you registered your objection. That keeps it open. What yes? I, what about I take exception to your ruling? Well, if you want to be an entrepreneur and create new procedures, that's up to you. But I suggest you follow the standard procedure, which is to say, I object. You know, otherwise, you're, you're taking a chance. No, that's the second one. You object, he says overruled, then uh, you say, I take exception. Well, if you want to, you can. I mean, but once you've objected, that's it. I mean, he made the ruling. But that doesn't mean that he's authorized. It's on record. It's on record. You object. Yeah. Okay. So can he find you in contempt if you keep objecting to his, uh, to his rulings? Well, it doesn't normally get that way unless you've generated a lot of hate in the courtroom. <laughs> I mean, I, I keep these things friendly. You know, I mean... When, if the judge is, it, it finds you in contempt because you object, that, you, that tells me that something's wrong here in how you handle things. Because objecting is such a standard procedure. Nobody's going to find you in contempt. 
All you're telling me that he, he, he's using it as an excuse to carry out in another agenda, all right? So I, I suggest that uh, you get to that stage, something's wrong. You should have been alerted to yourself long before that, that you're not handling things right. Just to object, you know, and you don't have to be loud. You don't have to be obnoxious. You say it with a smile. You know, I object, Your Honor. How do we get the report for that from, to find out if we objected? I mean, is that, do we have to pay for the... Uh, no, don't you know when you object? <laughs> well, if it's, it's not recorded now. Oh. It's recorded in your memory. I mean, you know, you just move forward on these things. If they, you make your claims. In your paperwork, if, when you file paperwork later on, you, you state in your paperwork that you had objected. You know, whatever your follow-up paperwork would be. You know, that becomes part of, uh, part of the whole history, you know, of, of the court proceeding. Yeah, you know, I understand that they don't always put things in the record that they should have. Make notes. Huh? Make notes. Yeah, they don't always make notes. You make notes, but they don't, you know. So, so anyway, but you see that little proceeding, just as I showed it there, that's really all that's necessary. My hearings seldom last more than five minutes, okay? Because I don't stand there and argue. I just say object and I let him roll on. What takes me a lot of time is the full day or two days it takes me to write the paper. <laughs> <laughs> to reverse his, his decision, but <laughs> that takes time. But you know, the, the actual proceeding is extremely short normally. Now I have no control over the other side, but usually the other side doesn't have much to say either. But you can encourage them to say more if you want and run your transcription expenses up. But if you just keep it simple and say, I object, okay? All right, so that's all that is necessary. You then move on to the next item of business, all right? The judge is going to do whatever he chooses. You have not the power to stop him at that time, just as you have no power to stop a robber from robbing you. At this point, your only goal is to object for the record. Later, after you leave the courtroom, you type and file the court order to vacate or correct the judge's decision. But remember, this can only be done if you are the plaintiff, one of the people of the jurisdiction, in a court of record, and have not given anyone, including the judge, any permission to do anything in your case. Okay, you've got to have this thing locked down. And so when that, if you're in a court of record, it's an absolute, no exceptions. The judge cannot make any decisions whatsoever. Okay, you are the decider. <clears throat> and then finally, point number three in a proceeding, if you are, let's say, incarcerated, you know, and they bring you out before a judge, then this next paragraph applies. If you are a defendant who is the petitioner in a habeas corpus or a plaintiff in a counterclaim, you should repeat to the other court your demand to be released. You are cha challenging jurisdiction. Because they asserted jurisdiction, you should from time to time remind them of your demand to be immediately released from their custody. They probably won't release you, but again, you're building the history of the case and this all works against them in the long run. Do you become an injured party? If they continue in custody? Yes. Okay. Yes, you become eventually an injured party because they held you without jurisdiction, assuming that's the point, assuming that you arrive at the point where you've determined that they don't have jurisdiction. Okay. So much for that. That was all under procedure. Okay. Now, here's another good one. Tax court. You all heard of tax court, right? No. <clears throat> Did you know that the tax court, by legislative definition, is a court of record? Oh. Is that significant to you? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> The tax court and the court of claims, by my understanding, are the only two courts in the federal system where you do not have to prepay your taxes before you challenge them. 
any other court, United States District Court, whatever, you have to prepay and then sue to get it back. But if you, if you go to tax court, you do not have to prepay. Or if you go to the Court of Claims, you do not have to prepay. <clears throat> now, when you go to the, to the tax court, who is the plaintiff? We are. Right. You're the petitioner, and the government is the defendant. Because yeah. you're the one who moves to go to the tax court, not them. Mm -hmm. Okay? And if you look at 26 U.S.C. 7441, Title 26 is the Internal Revenue Code. Okay. And United States Code, Section 7441, here's what it says. There is hereby established under Article I of the Constitution of the United States a court of record to be known as the United States Tax Court. The members of the tax court shall be the chief judge and the judges of the tax court. Now, get this. The United States, through the legislature, Article I, has agreed to release jurisdiction to you. It's a court of record. Who's the sovereign of the court? You. It's your jurisdiction. Yep. They acknowledge it. You see, although they set up the court, they also block themselves out of it. They can't make a decision. Correct. Wow. The magistrate who's sitting up there in the, in, in the tax court cannot make any decisions whatsoever because it's a court of record. <clears throat> the the, the uh, <clears throat> you cannot have statutes in a court of record. Okay? That's right. It's common law. It's not a court of record if it's not going to common law. Okay? It's a pretty powerful concept here. So you take them into tax court and you're saying, I don't owe those taxes. And it's the responsibility of the government to prove to whom? You. To you. That they do have jurisdiction. Now what happens to most people? They go into court, they don't know this. And what happens? The judge takes over. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay, you had a question. So just in relevance to current events, I understand that Wesley Snipes about a couple months ago got cleared of most of his felony charges sure. of tax evasion, but recently was convicted of a couple of charges and is now going to three years. Okay. What happened there in tax court? Well, he, he, he let go. Yeah, was it tax court? Was it tax court? Was it U.S. District Court? Yeah, it's criminal charges. Okay, criminal charges. But see, had he done a counterclaim, he could have knocked that in the head. But he used regular <clears throat> attorneys. He used regular attorneys who used statutes to argue their case. And not only that, but they also probably, it wouldn't surprise me, they also used the tax code, oh, yeah. Internal Revenue Code. However, let's take a look at Section 7806 of the United States Code, 26 U.S.C. 7806. Okay. Under jurisdiction. Okay. And we have the Internal Revenue Code, Section 7806. Now, 7806, subsection B, says, no inference, implication, or presumption of legislative construction shall be drawn or made by reason of the location or grouping of any particular section or provision or portion of this title. It says more, but we can stop there. Now. Look at that phrase, presumption of legislative construction. You cannot make any presumption of legislative construction. That's a fancy way of saying you can't presume that it's law. The legislature didn't intend to build anything out of this. You can't construct anything out of it. They, they just wrote these words. They didn't mean anything by it. <laughs> They're pretty tricky here. No presumption of legislative construction. No inference, no implication. Does everybody know the difference between implication and inference? Well, one is a Party A and Party B are talking. Okay. okay. Party A 
says something which implies, he's implying something mm -hmm. for the other person. On the other hand, perhaps party A didn't imply anything, but party B inferred something from what he heard. So yeah. the speaker implies, the listener infers. Uh, as I understand it too, you might want to go over the fact of whether it was put into the Federal Register or not. Title 26 was never published in the Federal Register. Only those codes that are published in the Federal Register apply to the people. That's not significant here. The reason it's not significant is because it says right here, the rest of the code's not law. You don't have to go do heavy research. You just stay on the, on the plain, bla uh, plain surface of the black letter of the law, so to speak, only it's not law. You cannot, they, they, they're saying here, you cannot infer as the, as the reader that there's legislative construction here. In other words, you can't infer there's any law. You cannot imply, the, the, the legislature cannot imply that there's legislative construction. There's no implication by their statements in this, in this book, okay? So there's neither implication nor inference. And you cannot presume it, okay? There's no presumption of later, it's simply not law, okay? And you, 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 the, uh, so anybody can say, well, such and such code section says so-and-so. Oh, really? So you're citing a code section, right? Well, this says that that means you can't presume anything just because it's there. Now, this issue came up with the Nordby Supply Company versus the United States. And uh, basically, now this is kind of tricky. You gotta, you gotta follow this one closely. Otherwise, you get lost on, on the last turn, all right? But what happened was they made fishing lures. And there was some provision in the law. And uh, Nordby Supply Company said that the IRS could not tax it, okay? And the reason they said that the IRS could not tax it was because the code prohibited it. The court agreed. The court said Nordby was right that IRS could not tax because the code prohibited it. IRS appealed to the appellate court. The appellate court said, no, you're wrong because it's not law. So you cannot use the code to prohibit the IRS from taxing Therefore, Nordby had to pay the tax. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and it ended there? They didn't appeal again? Well, I think what it went up to the Supreme Court. Did it? it went up to F second here. I guess that's yeah. that it. Yeah, it went to the Supreme Court. But see, it went, it, it, and this is from the Ninth District, too, see, California. So, Court of Appeals, Ninth District. I think that's what CA9 means. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, there's a twist in the logic. But look at the beauty of this. I, this, to me, is a wonderful case. But look, the legislature said it's not law. The IRS says it's not law. And the courts say it's not law. You got all three branches on your side. So when you got tax issues coming up and the IRS sends out its notice saying that, well, uh, Title 26, Section so-and-so says you're obligated, blah, 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 blah. That's not law. Okay? So there's your basis for your counterclaim. They're asserting a jurisdiction they don't have. Make sense? I hope you can all see that from that first sentence there, no inference, implication, or presumption of legislative construction, that means you can't assume any law is here. Anywhere in the book. Title 26 is gone, as far as I'm concerned. I got a passport application one time. And on the back of the passport application, they had a section they wanted me to fill out with like name and address. And, and they, they were open. They said this was for the IRS. 
Okay, this is a requirement of the IRS. So in the spot where they had for social security number, I put exempt per 26 USC 7806. Well, it's not law, I'm exempt, right? <laughs> yeah? Phil, why don't, why don't all the other uh, tax uh, uh, deniers uh, use this argument? Use it in court. To me, this is the gatekeeper argument. I mean, you know, I don't know anything significant about the Internal Revenue Code other than this. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this is the gate. If they can get through this gate, then it opens up for them. But as long as I shut the gate on them, where do they go? So, good question. And I have told Erwin Schiff about this. I've told, uh, uh, what's this guy, the banker in, in uh, Newport Beach? You know who I'm talking about. No, the banker. In, in Newport Beach. In, uh, huh? Yeah, Anthony Hargis. I told him about it. I, I've told many people about it. I don't know. They don't, they, don't, they, don't grasp it. they don't grasp it. I don't know why, but they don't. And I, 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 I frankly, I divide the uh, community into two groups of people. There are the winners and there are the fighters. And I think they're fighters. <laughs> okay. okay. You give them an opportunity to win, they'll turn it down. Because that, that finishes the fight. <laughs> That's how I look at it anyway. So, but I mean, to me, it's perfectly clear when I got all three branches of government telling me it's not law. Do I have to file a 1040 by virtue of this? You don't file a 1040. Uh, that, that was my question. Or if you do file it, you file it without prejudice according to the UCC. Well, it, it, Section 1207, which now has a new number, I don't know what the new number is, they, they basically have said that you can preserve your rights. If you, if you uh, uh, say the words without prejudice or the words under duress, either one of those two phrases, you say that, that preserves your rights so that later you can back. The, the Uniform Commercial Code is actually quite a... a, a quite a tremendous document. And they put a provision in here that acknowledges the fact that you might be cornered. Okay, you know, like a rat gets cornered. You know, and, and so uh, they said, look, on a practical side, you may have no choice but have to sign the contract or paper or whatever it is. So the law says, or actually the statute, okay, actually the code, right? Uniform Commercial Code says, look, when you're in, that, in a position where you want to preserve your rights, but you still want to move forward, you know, I mean, like you got to eat, you need a job, just sign it without prejudice, okay? And that preserves your rights. Later on, when you're in a stronger financial position or a stronger negotiating position, you come back and sue them for what they did to you. Yeah. You were talking about passports and the social security number box. Uh, if you research the law behind that, they're not asking for your social security number. They're asking for your taxpayer identification yeah. number. Yeah, well, whatever, it's exempt. Right, but what I found was mm -hmm. if they ask for that, they allow you the option to provide a statement instead. So I did that. I provided a statement that I am not a taxpayer, therefore I cannot have a taxpayer identification number. Mm -hmm. And I provided the statement with the application. They ended up giving me a number. Of, they usually give the passport with your social security number on it. Mm -hmm. So in this case, they had to provide me with another number. Okay, there you go. Sure. Mm -hmm. Apparently worked. Do you have the reference of that UCC code that you were talking about where it says that without prejudice? Well, it was 1207. I don't know what the new number is. Look, the, the uh, oh, look who sneaked in. <laughs> who left the door unlocked? <laughs> I did. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. Okay. Anyway, uh, did you say the 26 USC 7806B? What? B as in boy? Yeah, subsection B, 7806B. And you said that's the gatekeeper or the exemption? What? 
I'm so asleep what I'm saying. Well, correct me there. What is what, it? What there? about the extension? No, what, what is it then? Uh, the 7806 seven, seven, you're talking about? I'm talking about the first, first sentence in sec, subsection B. Okay, what, what's that all about? Yeah. It, what it's about is that the, the, the rest of the Internal Revenue Code is not law. Okay. But you didn't That's what I've been talking about all along. Yeah, but you're not mentioning, I think you, I've overheard you said exemption, no? No, I didn't. He didn't say about exemption? No, I said I, when I filled out the uh, form for the passport in the little box where they had Social Security number requested, I put that I was exempt okay. because of... 26 U.S.C. 7806. No more B. It doesn't matter. Oh, well, it's part you of you it. You gotta put complete in there. Don't don't put me hanging. It's included. It's okay. there. And then you mentioned about something about the TIN. Yeah, the TIN. They ask you for it. They want your tax identification number. So he said he didn't have one because he's not a taxpayer. So they gave him one. Well, there's two ways you put your social security number with a dash or with dash. TIN is without the dash. TIN is a tax credit application. Next question. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Can't have one. That's between you and me. I'll have to answer that. So my question is on the 1040, because yeah. under the 1040 it says that under penalty of perjury, uh, you, sure. you basically are signing your life away. Sure. So if you uh, ac actually uh, submit an addendum to your tax form and say that you're filling this out under duress. That still preserves your constitutional rights to go back and seek remedy? Well, not constitutional rights, but it does preserve your rights. So you can do a counterclaim? Later it. on, when you get in a better negotiating position, <coughs> sure. <coughs> you can take it out of their hide later. <laughs> Sorry? Sure. Bill, uh, my favorite section of the IRS code is 6331A. Mm -hmm. Have you read that carefully? Don't need to because everything's blocked with 7806. I understand that. Today I understand that now. Mm -hmm. But 6331A, if you read it, is wonderful. Mm -hmm. It says that the people who are to pay taxes mm -hmm. are elected or appointed federal uh, employees, sure. um, elected or appointed. Yeah, but you can't do that. Why? Because the minute you acknowledge validity to 6331, you threw out 7806. Oh, really? You threw out your protection. Oh, you really? cannot acknowledge any of it. If you not acknowledge that it's valid law, then you're done. Oh. <clears throat> you, you stay at, the, there's the doorway here. You open that door, they go in and they start bringing other stuff in. Uh -huh. When you, you, you give them that first challenge, 7806 say, says none of it is valid. And if they try to quote any of it, no good. You Gone. Know, there's another thing, too, that was discovered after mm -hmm. 12 years. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I cannot quote it, uh, but it, is, it was buried in the mm -hmm. archives for 12 years. Sure. And then the, uh, the private attorney general and his staff dug it up. And it says the same thing that you're saying. Yeah, but see, that, that's the beauty of this. You don't have to do heavy research. You don't have to be knowledgeable about the code. Yeah. It, Just understand it, that one first line, that sentence. Does yeah. It all. I mean, right. What more is there to do? Exactly. And when they try to pull you off track through discussion or they try to get you to talk in the courtroom, mm -hmm. they'll use that as an excuse that you have acknowledged its validity. So that's why you don't say anything. You just say, it's all in the paperwork. Anything I have to say, I've said in my paperwork. Uh -huh. See? Or I object to those questions. Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> uh, quite a few years ago. Quite a few? Yeah. I, I'm sure at least... Uh, in the 90s? Uh, possibly so, yeah. Did you use it successfully? Only for passport. No, but I mean for, for not filing income tax returns? Well, I haven't been challenged on it. Oh. I've never been challenged on my not filing. Someday I might be, but and if I if they do, this is where it's coming. I hope they're watching this tape. <laughs> so, Bill. Yeah. Are you below the radar? Apparently. 
Either that I've chosen. No, I don't think I'm below the radar because I went through a, a, a pretty in-depth investigation one time involving all the three-letter agencies. I mean, we had FBI, we had the INS, we had the CIA, we had a whole bunch of them. The whole army. Uh, yeah, I was involved with a corporation that uh, they had three quarters of a billion dollars in, in, uh, in managed assets. And I was head of the legal department. And so they came in, they swept in, and, and they, all of the top officers went to jail. My department was the only one that nobody went to jail because we were the only ones that were honest in that company. <clears throat> Believe it or not, I had two attorneys and I had a secretary and, uh, and I had a, a paralegal. And when customers called in, we would advise them not to do certain things. And so that surprised everybody. We were actually honest. You know, we didn't cooperate with top management because we knew that they were doing illegal stuff. And, uh, and some of those customers that called in did it anyway. And so when, when the uh, when the investigating agencies came to them and asked these people about it and they were trying to find some dirt on us, on our legal department, those very same people said, yeah, they advised me not to do this, but I did it anyway, <laughs> you know, because he got sweet talked into it by some other department. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm very happy to say that, that the other people, they got 20 year sentences and we didn't even get accused. And that was, and, and so I got thoroughly investigated. And during the investigation, some of my customers were contacted on my own independent business. And, and the investigator was advising the, the customers not to do business to me, that I was of a questionable character. The problem is, is that all of these customers had known me for like more than 10 years. They know who and what I was about, and knew how noisy I was about uh, rights. And so <laughs> they just laughed it off, you know. So it made no difference. But they tried. You know. <laughs> now, I don't know which agency it was that, that did it, but I know that we had a whole passel full of agencies investigating this thing. It was a big deal. Went international. We had properties all over the world. So, <laughs> you know. So my question is, with, yeah. with the business that you have and what you do and, and you know, what you do for I a haven't living, been challenged yet. You haven't been challenged. No, no notices or anything from the IRS Franchise Tax Board. Uh, on two different occasions, I actually got a phone call because people file 1099s on right. me. And I've gotten phone calls and then I just say to them, you know, I just let them know that, no, I, I'm not eligible. <laughs> you know? You're not eligible? Yeah, not, not, I'm not qualified to, to file taxes. You know, I, I just, I, they go away. Okay. But see, I, I suspect I do have some sort of reputation I mean, because of that, that in-depth investigation, if nothing else. They don't want to touch you. But I've been around for quite a few years. I've had my website up for quite a few years now. So, you know, this website is not new. And before there were websites, I had a, a bulletin board system that was up with all this information. Well, not all of it. We developed it over time. But, but uh, yeah, as far as I know, and I've had, uh, I've had uh, uh, spy people in on, on there. And that, I can't say that positively, but I suspect it. I mean, uh, one time there was a, a meeting that I was speaking at, and uh, a friend of mine was, was in the audience, and he, he's much more observant than I am. And there were a couple people in the audience, and uh, he talked with them, just friendly-like, you know, and found out that they were bricklayers. You know, that's what they did for a living. The problem was they had new Levi's and they had office hands, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and they were bricklayers. <laughs> so anyway, agency uh, bricklayers. Yeah, right. So, um, but see, I suspect that the reason that uh, I haven't been attacked is partly because I don't really make that much money in the first place. Okay. But another reason is, is that unlike a lot of other people I know, I am not advocating against the government. As I pointed out, my mission statement is this. Through the courts, I want to encourage the government to obey the law. Now, that's a tough one to fight against. They're not, how can they accuse me of being a terrorist when I'm asking the government to obey the law? And I'm advocating obeying the law. And that's genuine. It's not, you know, we have a system. I think it's a good system. It, it does have some defects, which all systems do. And one of the defects is, is that there is opportunity for abuse of power. And that's true of any system anyway. 
So uh, who can be against the prevention of the abuse of power? Other than the abusers themselves, you know? So uh, I'm, I'm not in the same category as other people, and, and I'm not in there trying to uh, destroy people's lives, and I'm not in there putting billion dollar judgments on, the, on, uh, on a city of, of 1,500 people, <laughs> you know, and stupid things like that. Anything I'm involved in is genuine. Genuine abuse, genuine, you know, application of law, and, and just because you're king does not mean you throw your weight around. You know, you, you gotta, in fact, whenever you exercise power, you should always exercise your power just short of what you could do, all right? When, when the, the first time we ever find a judge for contempt of court, the very first time we did it, the fine was one dollar, <laughs> okay? It sent the message, however. I mean, he changed his behavior. And uh, um, there, in, in all the, now I've been playing in this game for a couple decades at least. And, um, uh, and in all that time, only once in all that time have I ever had to issue a bench warrant for the arrest of a judge. Just once. You see, the thing that I find, believe it or not, I know this is hard for some people to stomach, but I find that most public officials are honest. I find that they share a lot of my opinions about abuse of power and are against it. But the problem is, is that if they have to choose between your rights and their job, not many are going to quit. Okay, they'll let your case go and try to do better on the next one. So, um, and I understand that. So I don't try to roast them for every little thing that happens. But I also try to set the conditions so that they can support me without risk to themselves. So when I bring in a court of record, and I, a court of record automatically suspends the judge. Automatically. He's fenced in. By definition, right. And the Constitution of California says all the courts are courts of record. And if, and if it didn't say it, it would still be a court of record because that's what the definition of a court of record is, and you choose the form when you are the plaintiff. You could choose admiralty court, you could choose whatever, whatever you think applies. I choose a court of record. And so uh, when I fence in the judge like that, he's actually freed up because he can say to his policymakers, he couldn't carry out policy because the law fenced him in. And, then, and what happens is that a normal, sensible judge gets friendly. He can't do anything, and he knows it, and it's legit. I mean, it's a real, genuine law fencing him in. And so they get real friendly, and they just, they conduct, you know, your turn to speak, your turn to speak, he listens, goes sides. And what's funny about it is, again, I'm not there to undermine the judge. And so the judge will look to the plaintiff side, that would be me or somebody, and he says, I think we ought to do such and such. Is that all right with you? And I'll say, yeah, that sounds good. I approve it, see, sovereign approval. And then he turns to the attorney and says, uh, what do you think, is that okay with you? And the attorney knows he better agree, okay? There's a big difference between the judge asking me and the judge asking the attorney. And I let him play the game. I let the judge look like he's in charge. The attorney doesn't know that the judge asked me first because I'm the one that's in charge, see? So that, it, it, it really, and, and it's sort of, by allowing him to keep his image with his own people, because he has to work with these attorneys after you leave, you know, in other cases. So you, you want to understand that if you can help the judge to keep a good image, while at the same time preserving your rights, keep it friendly and so forth, it really makes a big difference in the success of the thing. Okay, anyway. I forgot my question, I'll let it ask it. Okay. Back to passports, we talked about one item. Uh, to refute the fact that you're not a citizen, in other words, do you